called it MNS. That's what I've got it from. <laughs> this isn't just any poem. <laughs> this is a choice selection of carefully constructed words and sounds, consonants and vowels, hand-picked individually and wrapped in subtle nuances, <laughs> with a faint drizzle of the aroma of time-soaked metaphor. This isn't just any poem. This is a sensual poem, an essential poem, a full fat, protein packed, saturated poem, a high carbohydrate slice of deviance devised under the influence. This isn't just any poem. This is a love poem and a hate poem, a war poem, an angry and irate poem. All neatly hand rolled into one delicious bite sized morsel. You could even call this a Latino poem, porque se va a compay que eso no es simplemente un poem. This isn't just any poem, this is one of them. Posh poems, one of them clever poems that's meant to tap dance around your head and river dance around your ears. This poem was designed to entertain you and then lure you into a false sense of complacent comfortableness so that finally I could talk to you about dessert and the disturbing trends in this world of creme brulee. Babies marinated underneath rocket attacks, left to soak in the stale sauce of their own blowtorched mothers. Or how about this? Young men still left to sweat it out in their orange jumpsuit skins serving time unknown something else we should never try at home but nevertheless still happens right here inside our own our very own kitchens young children left to simmer in detention centers for months pending their exportation but adding all of these raw random sour ingredients to the mix at such a late stage would undoubtedly unsettle the stomach and would prove virtually indigestible. So for the moment, I would like to declare this poem utterly unsuitable for consumption. <laughs> they asked me if I had a gay poem, so I said straight up, no. My poems don't meander between straight lines. My poems don't mince their words or bend or make queer little observations. They asked me if I had a gay poem, so I answered honestly, no, I don't have any gay poetry, and even if unthinkably I did, what would that say about me? I mean, even presenting the question puts me in a precarious position. How do I approach the subject with my own creation? Like, excuse me, poem, are you gay? <laughs> I've grown up contrarily to what I wanted you to say. I mean, I certainly did not write you that way. But something I said, something I did, that turned you, maybe I should have peppered your verses with sport, girls, and beer. Maybe as your author, I deserted you. Or did another writer turn you queer? <laughs> okay, let's say hypothetically that this poem is gay. Maybe it's just a confused poem that needs straightening out. <laughs> Maybe I could insert verses from Leviticus, speak over it in tongues, douse it in holy water, recite it the Quran, give it a beat, 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 boombox blasting in the street, Bati poem fi dead, bati poem fi dead, rip up chichi poem in a shred. They asked me if I had a gay poem, so I said no. But the truth is I didn't know until one of my very own poems stepped up and tapped me on the shoulder. It said, look here, dad slash author. I'm now that much bolder and I'm not confused, I'm not alternative. And even though the words I choose to marry with make me different, it don't make me any less eloquent. I don't need to be overly elegant. Maybe that's why I stepped under your radar. 
But why are you so afraid to embrace it? Face it, it's another part of me, you can't erase it. The more you try to label me with your twisted synonyms, the more you say you hate the sinner and despise the sin. The more you try to clip my words and stifle my expression, the more I know it's you, not me, whose morality should be called into question. They asked me if I had a poem. They said, choose one of your strongest, choose one of your best, choose a poem that don't stand for no foolishness. They asked me if I had a gay poem. So I said, yes. <laughs> like if I was from Mars, uh, a, a, you know, a gay Martian, <laughs> and I was looking down at Earth, deciding where I, I was going to go and live, I'd probably, being, being me, I'd probably read some constitutions, you know, find out about these states, which, which would be the best state to live in. And... I would end up living in Africa. I would live in Africa. I would live in South Africa, or maybe get there. I would probably live in South Africa. And um, I look to South Africa and I say, don't get, don't get me wrong, don't worry, I'm not gonna sit here and extol how you know, perfect South Africa is. You know, we know it's not. But what I'm saying is I would choose to live there according to what's written down in the law. That's the best place to live. If you're a lesbian, if you're gay, that's the best place on earth to live, constitutionally, right? And that, those freedoms were won as part of the struggle against apartheid, which wasn't about whether you were, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, some of those great leaders were African, black Africans, of course. Let's not take away from that history. But there were also white people, there were Jewish people, there were gay and straight people, there were communists. There were people that, there were all kinds of communities fought against the struggle from that, from that horrendous uh, regime. And gay people of all races were right at the heart of that. And people were drawn together by bigger issues, by the bigger, the bigger issues of racism and all of those, all, all of those, everything to do with the apartheid struggle, people pulled together. And it's a gay man, a white gay man, English man, drove Nelson Mandela, uh, drove with Nelson Mandela in his car posing as his passenger, when actually he was the driver, when they swapped seats and started driving, that's when Nelson Mandela got pulled over, arrested, and the rest is history. And it wasn't that, that that white man said to himself, because I'm a white man, these issues don't affect me. He could live his whole life in the privilege, uh, you know, all the, all the pleasures that, uh, that um, apartheid could give a white man. But no, he didn't say to himself, I'm a white man, this is not of interest to me. He was a white gay man, a communist, an English man, a theatre man. I'm a theatre person. Um, you know, that sat in that car with Nelson Mandela. And there were lots of people. So we shouldn't be limiting ourselves and breaking ourselves and pulling ourselves apart. We, we won't win that way. Because, you know, if we're only one in seven, I don't know what the latest statistic is, we need the other six. We need everybody with us. Yeah. And um, it's, it's one, one, you know, these are, we are one. It doesn't matter what, what's it, you know, if you're here, if you, if you care about these subjects, just like the anti-apartheid struggle. And also, I think the anti-apartheid struggle shows us something in terms of, I, I, I'm not such a great believer in limiting things down to, to single issues. We can't, especially, I went to Palestine recently, I work a lot in Palestine. And I was thinking, that, you know, we're going to talk about lesbian and gay issues in Palestine. But actually, people were coming back to me, well, you can't separate these things from the occupation. You can't separate these things from sexism. You can't separate the lesbian and gay movement from the position of women. You can't separate the lesbian and gay p p situation in Africa and in the diaspora without talking about poverty. You can't separate HIV from malaria. We can't separate these things out. Now, of course, we've got to be able to get together and talk very specifically. And it's good, it's great that we're here and talking about a single, single subject. But um, let's not be pulling ourselves apart, let's pull together.